Frame Raider. Nicktoons Battle for Volcano Island is a game for the Game Boy Advance. More known for its release on the PlayStation 2 and Nintendo GameCube, this title comes across as a completely different style of platformer in comparison. Now, it's rather typical that these licensed characters are met with mediocrity in video game titles and are often seen as shovelware. There's been a few games in the licensed pile that actually managed to bring in a rather engaging and enjoyable experience. Is this one to add to the pile? Or is it just another throw together to trick parents and children alike? Let's take a look. The game starts with Timmy Turner teleporting and falling into an unknown location. Apparently he's trapped despite the obstacle appearing quite traversable. Cosmo and Wanda, who are Timmy's fairies, take off to find Spongebob who has also somehow teleported to this general vicinity. The cast of characters continues to grow until you've made your way through a good couple levels where you'll end up with a roster of four. A crustacean creature tells you that he's brought you to the volcano island in hopes that they'd be able to get rid of an ancient evil called the Magu who's been infecting the island with purple ooze. Not a terrible curse, not a drought, thousands of years of bad luck, just purple ooze. From your own observation, it does appear as if this ooze has taken control of some of the wildlife, but it doesn't actually say anything about that in the game's text. You might end up missing this fact entirely. A tad later into the game, you find out that if you don't stop this evil, what the game refers to as the multiverse will collapse. Whatever the reason for that is, well, they didn't go as far as to explain probably would have been a good idea to do so, since really that's the prime motivation for the player, I would assume. Apparently this game serves as a sequel of sorts to an earlier title called Nicktoons Unite, which I've never had the chance to play. Perhaps that game further explains why the Nicktoons are going around saving parts of the world, but I'll have to check out that game another time to see if it elaborates on it. When Spongebob and Danny Phantom meet, they decide to contact Jimmy Neutron, the genius of the pack who for some reason didn't teleport to the island. I guess he wasn't very important to the crustacean creature, who as far as I know by the way wasn't given a name in this title. Apparently in the console version of the game, the crab is called the Wise Old Crab. Before they contact him, however, they have to find something to boost the power of the antenna on their communication device, as it isn't strong enough. This essentially introduces the gameplay to the player throughout the game, being to collect pieces scattered about in order to create a powerful device to wipe out the evil. The game takes place in a hub world, and you're unable to access later levels in the game until you've collected enough parts, as this Easter Island-type head sculpture prevents you from going further. They'll sink into the ground upon approaching them, given you've collected the number of required parts. There's no speaking of these sculptures in the game and for why they collapse when you collect a certain number of parts, I have no idea, but that's how the game plays out and so long as it works, I suppose this isn't really something to complain about. Typically, these areas require a specific power-up found in another level to navigate through, so blocking them off until later was indeed necessary. The hub world is perfectly sized for the type of game it is, but I do wish it was a bit more distinct as a lot of it tends to look the same and quite often finding the next level is up to trial and error because of this. The sub-worlds themselves look pretty nice. Nothing too memorable, but it works. Collecting parts isn't the only goal present in the game, as there are also five mini yellow hearts to collect through each level, which add up to a total score when you return to the hub world. Larger numbers of these can unlock bonus secrets, and it's more of a replayability thing than anything else. Probably don't go for a completionist run, however, as literally once you've collected all the hearts, you get the most underwhelming reward I've seen in a long time. All that hard work for basically nothing. Yeah, collecting these hearts can be rather difficult at times, so I don't think the risk is at all worth that 100% quote-unquote reward. These risks are however fun to pull off due to the nature of the game's level design. There are many different environments in this title, and you'll journey from expansive jungles to a barren desert and of course a lot more. The good thing about these levels is they aren't just linear set paths. In fact, there are branching paths all over, which in some cases have you go past beforehand thinking, well there's probably something later in the level I'll pick up that'll help me navigate this terrain. If anything, these are even hinted towards in the hub world, and that makes for pretty good game design. Smart level design makes the player think and consider what's coming up next. It brings anticipation and opens new possibilities. Of course, this alone isn't what makes level design good. Well, there's a lot of positives here, but there's also a couple negatives. The levels often require you swap through characters and abilities to make your way to the next location, which is ultimately a very satisfying experience. It's fun and challenging, but sometimes it can be a bit too much. The issue here is that the physics of the characters isn't exactly the easiest thing to analyze. This is a particular issue in the various power-ups, as you begin to realize how flimsy they can feel. Timmy Turner's launch power-up is a bit difficult to adjust to as it requires you pull down on the D-pad in specific directions to properly land at your destination. The issue here is that there's really no telling how far you're going to end up and how fast you're going to get there. This is in a nutshell what comes off as a problem for basically every character in the game. SpongeBob's ability to dig into the ground doesn't really have a way of telling you when you're going to pop out, and the way he slides around underground is so wishy-washy that you can often get harmed by environmental elements without believing you were really in the vicinity to do so. Patrick's flight-by-pants move also works a tad bizarre with the physics, as the wind elements seem to be rather confusing to get used to. These off-putting physics can sometimes interfere with the flow of the game, as upon being damaged, you'll be thrown back to the last checkpoint. For those deciding to pursue the yellow hearts, these count towards your health meter. 
Once you've lost one, you've lost your chance to 100% complete the level. This isn't a bad idea, in fact, I think it's smartly integrated, but the cheap nature of the physics can really throw you for a loop in this. You do get the option to restart the level, and levels themselves are not too long, so it's never a huge deal. Luckily, of the 115 yellow hearts in the game, I believe you only need 60 of them to unlock the two bonus levels in the game. I've heard there is a third bonus level, but I was never able to find it. The first one's pretty neat, the second one wasn't really worth it at all. However, this time through, I didn't collect enough yellow stars to show it to you. Nicktoon's Battle for Volcano Island is a vibrant game for the Game Boy Advance. The nice blend of colors makes for a visually engaging experience, and this ties perfectly to the level design. There are no doubt a couple problems here and there, and the game is indeed quite short. Still, depending on the price tag, this is actually a really fun platformer for what it is, and I would definitely recommend it if you can find it for under $5.